Hello, I'm the Dark Master, and welcome to the pre-ultimate episode of The History of the Elephants. This time we'll be covering the family's origins, the great genus Paleoloxodon, and the most famous of all extinct elephants, the mammoths. The subfamily known as Elephantinae split from their close relatives the Stegotetra belladontinae in the late Miocene. The first representative was the genus Prime Elephus. This creature was notably the most primitive of the subfamily, as indicated by the small pair of lower tusks in its jaws. It also is the common ancestor of the mammoths, Paleoloxicon, and the two genera of living elephants. From here, they diverged some four to six million years ago into their various lineages. That division led to two tribes, which are a taxonomic rank above a genus and below a family, for those curious. The tribes are Loxodontina, the African elephants, and the tribe Elephantina, the Eurasian elephants. Of these, the Loroxodontina includes the African elephants, Loroxodonta, which have been covered in the final episode. But let me just say, they have some controversy in them. The other subtribe, Elephantina, the Eurasian elephants, was way more diverse, with three genera Elephus, which includes the surviving Asian elephant. Paleoloxodon, which included the largest known land mammal of all time, and Mammuthus, the mammoths. Let's start with Paleoloxodon and its many species. Now, this is not the first time we've discussed individual species. A similar discussion occurred in episode 7, where we discussed some of the Stegodon species, and in several of the older episodes as well. Now, this may seem a bit odd. But let me explain before we do a deep dive into this group, because of all the episodes so far, this would be the most focused on species. Preservation in the fossil record is determined by two things, mainly, time and environment of death. Mammoths and Paleoloxodon, along with the living elephants, lived far more recently than, say, the Gompotheres or Moatherium. As such, there are many more skeletons that have survived. Also, most of these species lived in habitats far more conductive to fossilization, such as colder and dry regions prone to flooding. Now, to be fair, the habitat that Paleoloxodon lived in were rainforests, similar to Stegodons, and Stegodon isn't well known from entire skeletons. But the Eurasian forests appear to have a higher frequency of caves, mostly due to their limestone-centric geology in comparison to that of South Asia. These sinkholes would trap Paleoloxodon and preserve their bodies in the highly mineralized water. Caves in general are a very good place for preservation, as we see on many islands, such as Hawaii. Now that we've clarified exactly why we know so much about these genuses, let us start with Paleoloxodon. The earliest species of Paleoloxodon was Paleoloxodon reque from East Africa. Even this primitive species was already massive, with an old male that was 40 years old when it died, being 14 feet tall and weighing 12.3 tons. In life, it was a huge grazer that would have looked much larger than living elephants, as is typical in this genus. Except for the tusks that are way more straight 
than the modern elephant. And a very large dome-like head. These features will become far more prominent in future species. It was discovered by Wilhelm Ol to Diavian in 1894. Eventually, Paleoloxodon reke would go extinct in Africa, having ranged across Africa between 3.5 to 1 million years ago, perhaps outcompeted by the African elephants in the Pleistocene, but not before leaving Africa for Eurasia, where population evolved into the next species from which the rest are descended from. This was Paleoloxodon antiquus, the straight-tusked elephant. The straight-tusked elephant sp spread from Europe and Western Asia during the middle to late Pleistocene, approximately 781,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago to present. Unlike the coexisting mammoths. It preferred warmer conditions and flourished during the interglacial episodes during the Ice Age when the glaciers retreated. It would have spread during the warm times even as far north as Great Britain and then retreated south when the winter returned. In appearance, the straight test elephant was large, but smaller than its predecessor Paleoloxodon Reke. At a mere 13.1 feet tall and 11.3 tons. Another defining trait of the species, as shared with the genus, is the extremely longer legs than those of modern elephants. It is also believed to have had an 80 centimeter long tongue to help the animal eat on leaves and grasses. Speaking of plants, many familiar groups were eaten by the straight tusked elephant with the exact proportion depending on the location and season, with browsing occurring mainly during the spring and summer, and more grazing during the fall and winter. These plants included maple, horn beans, hazelnut, alder, ash, beech, and ivy. They were all consumed, as indicated by known gastric contents, as well as food residue, found on teeth, which is amazing preservation, by the way. Like modern elephants, the straight-tusked elephant lived in a small herd of 5 to 15 individuals and relied heavily on fresh water, which influenced its annual migrations. It is believed that these straight-tusked elephants might have been cut up and preyed upon by the primitive humans, such as Homo heidenbergensis. But we will turn to that later. But suffice it to say, this species evolved into many, many different species. In India, the species Paleoloxodon nematicus, also called the Asian straight tusked elephant, considered very closely related sister species, the straight tusked elephant, evolved. It is often considered a subspecies of the latter, but for the sake of this video, I'll consider it a separate species. This is, of course, my opinion, but many scientists do consider them to be separate species. The major distinction are an even thicker head dome and the greatest size of the genus. Paleoloxicon nematicus average size seems to have been over 17.1 feet at the shoulder and 22 tons in weight, making it the largest land mammal to ever live. In life, it probably lives similar to the straight tusked elephant mentioned earlier. However, not all Paleoloxodons became giants. One group of Asian straight tusked elephants crossed from Eurasia to Japan via a land bridge that connected the two. And once the land bridge submerged, it evolved independently and spread across Japan. This lineage was Paleoloxodon naromi, also called Narman's elephant. This was the first of the many quote-unquote dwarf island species to evolve. Although, we have to remember, dwarf here is relative. 
Due to the presence of predators and the large island size of Japan, it only shrunk to 8.2 feet tall. Now this is only a little smaller than the modern Asian elephant, but keep in mind its ancestor was the largest land mammal of all time, so this still constitutes a dwarf, which is quite interesting. However, that isn't the most interesting part of its existence. The largest of these dwarf elephants, Norman's elephant, convergently evolved mammoth-like layers of fat and long fur, which served as protection against the colder Japanese climate. The species also had a pair of long, twisted tusks that grew to more than eight feet long and a very large bulge on the head. It lived on and ate subarctic conifer trees. The species was discovered by the German Heinrich Edmund Norman, who is also called the father of Japanese geology. You can kind of tell where the species got its name from. Meanwhile, on the other side of Eurasia, more specifically the Mediterranean, many islands were colonized by the straight-tusked elephant. On these many islands, various species of truly dwarf forms evolved. Of these, two well known, and the others are less so. Let's go by this island by island, shall we? On the island of Telos lived the species Paleoxodon tilinius. It stood 5 feet 11 inches at the shoulder, and as such was one of the larger of the dwarf Paleoxodons in the Mediterranean. However, it was much smaller than its ancestors. It evolved 45,000 years ago, a very recent development. It also survived until 4,000 BCE, which is way longer after humans arrived on Telos, making it one of the rare exceptions when an island elephant actually survives the appearance of humanity. In fact, there's some speculation that Paleoxican Tilinius, or very similar species, might have survived even longer, as the Reichmeyer tomb of ancient Egypt had a painting of many exotic animals leashed by traders. One of these is a small hairy elephant with slender legs and upwards curving tusks. While it cannot be known whether this is a mutant elephant, artistic license, or another extinct elephant, it is an interesting idea. On Cyprus, a little further to the east, a sequence of two Paleoloxodon species existed. The first was the species Paleoloxodon exlacu that emerged 200,000 years ago. But it's little known about that species, so let's go over to the other one, which is probably the second most well-known dwarf Paleoloxodon. Paleoloxodon cypriotis, also known as Cyprus Dwarf Elephant. This dwarf elephant was very small at 4 feet 7 inches and emerged relatively recently at 20,000 years ago. Very interestingly, its skull was thought to have been the inspiration for the Greek myth of the Cyclops, ironic that a dwarf inspired a giant. Its nose hole really does remind one of an eye orbit, though the actual eye orbit of the skull can be seen a little lower. Apparently, Greeks just didn't notice that. To the west, on the islands of Sicily and Malta, which are actually united as one island occasionally during lower sea level periods in the Pleistocene, Two separate species of dwarf Paleoloxodon emerged from different lineages. Let's start with the first and most famous one, Paleoloxodon falconi, also known as the pygmy elephant. It is known as that for a good reason, being one of, if not the smallest elephant to have ever existed at 2 feet 7 inches. In fact, it was so small that in appearance, it looked like a juvenile of the, its massive ancestors and was considered as one before it was discovered to be a separate species. It had specialized shorter limbs from running and clambering over rough terrain. Another interesting fact is that this species 
had an enormous brain case in comparison to modern elephants. This meant that the species might have been smarter than the extant elephants, which are already very smart, which would make them on par with dolphins and apes. Unfortunately, this species did not survive, nor did its intelligence save it. After emerging 550,000 years ago in the mid-Pleistocene, it died out when 200,000 years ago, further lowering of sea levels allowed competition from the mainland to occur, with deer and lions leading to the species' eventual extinction. However, a second lineage also came over, Paleoloxodon mendriensis. Due to the presence of predators and competition, it remained relatively large, about 5 foot 9 inches and 2,400 pounds, which is still a 90% body reduction compared to its ancestors. It still possessed limb adaptations for more fast and agile movement on rough terrain. Interestingly, its tongues are very variable in shape, which is not very common in elephants. Paleoloxodon mainland species died out around two to four thousand years ago, near the end of the Pleistocene, with the Asian straight tusked being the last. There is controversial claims that it might have survived in northern China until three thousand years ago, based on teeth and a ritual bronze vessel. However, this has become controversial with more scrutiny. The island species survived much longer well into the Holocene, as I went over previously. Now, let's go over the elephant relatives you came here for. The genus Mammuthus, better known as the mammoths. These are the best known genus of extinct elephants, which is only a single species that's relatively little known. It is possible to reconstruct the entire evolutionary history of this genus through morphological studies. Unfortunately, most people only know the one species, but don't worry, I'll educate you on this one, because I love elephants. Like the Paleoloxodon story, the story of Mammuthus starts in Africa. The mammoth lineage begins in South Africa, with the oldest representative being Mammuthus saplaniformis, the South African mammoth, which appeared in the Pliocene around 5 million years ago in what is today South Africa and South Ethiopia. It likely lacked a hairy coat and layer of fat due to its habitat, though it did possess the characteristic spirally twisting tusks that are unique to mammoths. It was 12.1 feet tall at the shoulder and weighed 9 tons. Moving northwards, a new species called Mammuthus africanivus, known as the African mammoth, evolved. It spread from southern Africa to cover the entirety of Africa from the late Pliocene to the early Pleistocene around 3 million to 1.65 million years ago. It was a smaller species and originally believed to have been the direct ancestor to all later mammoths. However, this claim has recently been challenged, firstly by the fact that its tusks diverged more widely from its skull than later species of mammoths, and now the presence of a transitional species that have been the actual ancestor to all later mammoths that being the species Mammuthus rumenus. This species lived in the late Pliocene from 3.5 to 2.6 million years ago. It appears to have spread from Africa to Eurasia via the Levant and would have served as the origin for the subsequent species of mammoths. Its most distinct feature was its molars had 8 to 10 enamel ridges compared to its previous ancestors, that was more. Eventually, a population evolved 12 to 14 ridges, becoming the next species we shall discuss. This species was Mammuthus meridionalisus, better known as the southern mammoth, and it replaced the previous. 
it spread from Europe and Central Asia. It lived in the early Pleistocene from 2.5 to 1.5 million years ago. This species had a shoulder height of about 13.1 feet and an estimated weight of 10 tons. It had a robust pair of tusks, which are a shared trait in mammoths. Its molars had low crowns and a small number of enamel ridges, indicating it was a woodland browser of leaves and shrubs. This indicates it lived in a relatively warm climate, meaning it probably lacked dense fur. It did graze occasionally, but not much. It is believed that either the southern mammoth or its predecessor at some point swam to the island of Crete and evolved into the dwarf species Mammoth Creticus, or the Cretan dwarf mammoth. It stood 3 foot 7 inches, becoming the smallest mammoth to ever exist, and one of the smallest Perboscidians ever, though Paleoloxodon falconi was smaller. The Cretan dwarf mammoth is believed to have filled the browsing niche of a mid-sized deer on the island. This mini-mammoth seems to have gone extinct by the mid-Pleistocene about a million years ago, around the time there was a rising of sea levels during an interglacial phase that might have submerged so much of its environment it could no longer survive, unfortunately. Apparently it wasn't competition or humans, so hey... That's a plus. Back on the mainland, a population of southern mammoths evolved into the steppe mammoth, with 18 to 20 ridges on its molar. You might be sensing a pattern here. Well, you should, as mammoths can be very easily identified by their number of molar ridges. You see, mammoth species gradually increased the depth and man number of ridges to feed on more abrasive food such as grasses and became progressively more and more grazers as opposed to browsers. This of course continued with the step mammoth. It's not steppy, it's step, which is believed to have eaten grass in the Siberian steppe. It emerged across northern Eurasia during the middle Pleistocene 600,000 to 370,000 years ago. It was the first mammoth that is reasonably sure to have possessed fur on the majority of its body, though it was likely shorter than the future woolly mammoth due to inhabiting warmer, relatively warmer, I should add, regions. The steppe mammoth's skull was shorter than the southern mammoth's, but otherwise much bigger with the individuals reaching 13.1 feet at the shoulder, making it the largest of the mammoths, with a weight of 4.10 to 14.3 tons. This species was highly successful, spreading to the Mediterranean, where on the island of Sardinia, a second dwarf species evolved during the Middle Pleistocene. Mammothus laminorori, also known as the Sardinian dwarf mammoth, lived from 45,000 to 40,000 years ago. It stood at 4 feet 7 inches at the shoulder, about one-third the size of its ancestor. It died out apparently because climate changes towards the last glacial period rapidly made the island colder and drier, and it could not adapt in time. Back on the mainland, the steppe mammoth crossed into North America via the Bering Strait, which was a land bridge that connected Russia to Alaska. This population entered around 1.5 million years ago and retained a similar number of molar ridges, but became a new species called the Columbian Mammoth. It appears to have been only slightly smaller than the steppe mammoth, with a height of 13 feet at the shoulder, and a weight of about 10 tons. It had a high, single-domed head. 
Its tusks were very long, up to 16 feet long, and were very curved. Unlike the woolly mammoth, very little of its soft tissue has been found, with what little is known, indicating that it likely did possess fur. It was far less dense than that of the woolly mammoths, more similar to the modern-day elephant than its cousin. We do know quite a bit about the species' paleobiology, though. Adults use their tusks for interspecies fighting during the mating season. This can be known as we have found a pair of males stuck together by their tusks and apparently died that way. Old and very young individuals were vulnerable to wolves and big cats like Homotherium. The Colombian mammoth was likely social and lived in matriarchal family groups, similar to modern elephants. This left the solitary males very vulnerable to being trapped in tar pits and sinkholes. An adult Colombian mammoth would have eaten upwards of 400 pounds of food per day and may have foraged for 20 hours. The Colombian mammoth ate many things in many ways. The trunk could pick up large tufts of grass, pick bulbs and flowers, or tear leaves and branches from trees and shrubs. The tusks could have dug up plants and stripped bark from the trees. Stomach contents indicate it ate sages, salt bush, sagebrush, grasses, fir, oak, maple, water birch, and blue spruce. In fact, mammoths may have encouraged the evolution of large fruits such as Osage oranges and Kentucky coffee trees. The Colombian mammoth could have lived around 80 years, as indicated by the size and state of several individuals, which had or stereolaments the Colombian mammoth at its height ranged from south of the Arctic Can Canadian biome all the way south to Costa Rica, east to west coast. It appears not to have lived in the Arctic, where a separate species lived, and it coexisted with mastodons and gopotheres in Mexico. Some of them even crossed onto the Channel Islands when the sea level was lower. This population gradually shrank into a new dwarf species, this species being Mammuthus exilus, also called the Pygmy Channel Island Mammoths. This pygmy species was 5.6 feet tall at the shoulder and 1,680 pounds in weight. Compared to its massive Colombian mammoth ancestor, this was quite smaller. This was to survive on much lesser amounts of food and resources after swimming to the islands. The lack of predators helped with that, enabling it to get much smaller. The pygmy mammoth thrived throughout the island's habitats, such as the plateaus, dunes, grasslands, riprine, and steppe tundra. Their feeding encouraged modification and the spreading of grasslands and their extinction has impacted the island. The extinction of the pygmy mammoths is believed to have been caused by a combination of factors. Climate change, such as sea level rise, would have put the pygmy mammoth in a stressful period before it could have shrunk further to compensate. This was further inflamed with a mass wildfire concurring with the species' extinction. Another factor was the arrival of the ancient Paleo-Indians, which we know hunted the mammoth. All of these led to the swift extinction of the adorable pygmy mammoth. The Colombian mammoth faced a similar fate, being hunted to extinction by the Clovis people, which also made some art of the mammoth before its loss. Of course, climate change and the species' large size put it at a disadvantage. It was a part of a greater mass extinction that we'll go over at the end of this video. Now, let's go over to the last of the mammoths and the one you have been expecting. The woolly mammoth. Mammothus primogenius was the last and most derived of the mammoths. 
with 26 ridges and extremely short and tall skull to hold its specialized teeth in, which it used to eat mainly grasses and sage, with only a little supplement of flowers, herbaceous plants, and tree matter. It used its tusks to remove the snow and ice from its food before grazing, similar to how musk oxen dig within the ice to get at plants. The woolly mammoth was actually one of the smaller of the mainland species, only having a height of around 11.2 feet and weighed up to 6 tons, a little smaller than an adult male African elephant. Its tusks were also way more curved than those of the other mammoths. This actually preserved weight better than those of the straight tusks of, say, Mammothus columbia, the Colombian mammoth. Even adult females had such curved tusks, though they were smaller. It appears that trunks of mammoths possessed a fleshy expansion a third of the way to the tip. Its front finger was longer. Its coat was the thickest of all, which it needed to live in the mammoth tundra. That stretched across northern Asia, Europe, and even into North America. It is believed that two main colors were the dominant color in the mammoth population, these being the dominant color, dark brown, and the recessive color of light tan. Its paleobiology, much like that of the Colombian mammoth, is very well known. Adults were able to defend themselves from predators with their tusks, trunks, and large size. But juveniles and weakened older individuals could be killed by wolves, cave hyenas, and big cats. The males attached each other using their tusks which were more for pushing than actually stabbing. The families lived in a matriarchal society, similar to adult elephants of today, and its close relatives. Being one of the most well-adapted members of Elephantidae for the cold, the woolly mammoth had a huge fat reserve on its neck, and the sort of fur mitten it used to keep its trunk's fingers warm. This species could live to the great old age of 60 years old, as indicated by bone rings. This, more than any other mammoth, interacted with the humans, coexisting with both Neanderthals and modern humans. Both species used mammoth bones and ivory for tools and carvings. Mammoths are in fact the third most commonly depicted animal in cave art. Sadly, this overexploitation would come at a grave cost. The woolly mammoth disappeared during the late Pleistocene, early Holocene in a wave of extinction called the Quaternary Extinction that also saw the extinction of the Macedons, the Paleoloxodons, and the Gompotheres, as well as the other mammoth species. This is believed to have been caused by humans, though climate did play a role. Apparently, the last mainland population died out in the Kaitaki Peninsula of Siberia in 9,650 years ago. These were not the last of the mammoths, however. On St. Paul's Island, Alaska, a population lived until 56,000 years ago, around the time that humans settled on Malta. This population died out due to a rising sea level before humans even got to the island. The last population lived on the famous Wrangell Island until the year 4000, the same year as the beginning of the construction of the Great Pyramids in ancient Egypt. This was extremely recent for, you know, megafauna standards. Wrangell Island mammoths may have been killed by humans when they arrived on the island, or they may have gone extinct slightly beforehand due to a sudden rise in global sea levels that got rid of most of the fresh water. 
Of course, this would have been impacted by their high level of inbreeding. And so ended the great mammoths, inbred and dwarfed due to human pressure and climate change. If you'd like the modern elephants to avoid that fate, consider donating to the African Wildlife Foundation. This is a great organization dedicated to helping African wildlife like the elephants. Speaking of join me next time for the final in the series, where we go over the modern-day elephant genuses and their species. I'm the Dark Master. This has been a wild ride. Consider subscribing to join me. Next time on the history of the elephants. So I went to the local Repticon yesterday. It was pretty fun. It was really interesting to see all the different color morphs and species. Though I will say one thing before showing you what I recorded. It said the banner. It said that there'd be amphibians, reptiles, and arthropods. I looked, there wasn't a single amphibian in there at all. Of course, it makes kind of sense, they're kind of hard to transport, but still, kind of a bit of false advertising. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this thing.